Hi, my name's Susanna. I'm the online editor for Civil Service World. I am joined today by Adrian Camelard at the end. He is director of commercial, po commercial portfolio from the Efficiency and Reform Group in the Cabinet Office. Next to him is Mark Fisher, Director of Job Seekers and Skills at DWP. We have uh, Rebecca Endian, Director of Analytical Services in the Ministry of Justice, and Jeff Llewellyn, who's uh, D Director of Public Service from Wipro. Now, we've had a really steer clear from the current government that they want to use payment by results wherever possible. And I think it's, you know, we all know the benefits. They're quite clear to see that it's moving from paying just for work done to actually paying for outcomes achieved. It's an intelligent way to use the limited resources we've got and to hopefully share risk with deliver delivery partners in an effective way. But it does raise a number of challenges. There's uh, a how we can align it with the drive to work more with charities and social enterprises who might not have the upfront capital to finance these kind of contracts. The people letting the contracts need to learn a whole load of new skills quite quickly. Uh, we need to be able to have reliable, consistent performance data, intelligent metrics to measure effectiveness, realistic measures of success, and an intelligent way to share that risk with your delivery partners. So, there's a lot to learn quite quickly if we're going to make this work. And there are also, of course, various different forms of payment by results. So what we have today is some experts who are already working in this field, and they will share their experiences with us. And then we'll hopefully have a chance for a Q&A session with you guys, the kind of challenges that you would like to get some answers to, and hopefully come up with some ideas and opportunities that could arise from making better use of payment by results. So we're going to start with the presentation from Adrian, thank you. Right, so good morning, <coughs> good morning, everyone, and thanks very much for having me here. Um, I, I'm an executive director in the cabinet office in the in this new body called the Efficiency and Reform Group, uh, and our role is actually to look at a, uh, in my team is to look at a wide range of commercial models and corporate constructs, all of which ultimately hope will allow. Um, the, uh, an objective to be achieved, which is better services for substantially less money than is the case at the moment. And within that, payment by results uh, are um, a really important commercial model. And I think while, while I'll leave to colleagues to discuss specific examples, specific case studies, what I'll touch on are the things that we are seeing when we look at uh, these projects coming through the pipeline, some of which uh, reach fruition and some of which do not. I think the, the, the key point to bear in mind about payment by results is it is potentially a, a very, very uh, attractive commercial model, not only for the public sector, but also for industry and other service providers. Uh, but it's also self-evidently very tricky. Um, if you don't get the right construct, if you don't get the right measures, um, it can lead to perverse outcomes uh, and unsatisfactory services. Um, and uh, um, a deal which is quite difficult to unpick. So I think it's important if you are thinking about embarking on a project, which is to include a payment by results uh, commercial model, to really focus on a number of critical areas. Um, I think it's already been touched on in the introduction. Understanding what the real metrics are, the key metrics, is critical. And it's got to be by reference by the industry serving you, as well as the policy that you're trying to deliver. Um, there, there's a real risk in looking at the policy outcomes in abstract terms and not really properly understanding what drives the behaviours of the, of the particular collection of companies who might uh, provide these services or um, a consortium that might well be a mix of uh, private sector, the voluntary sector uh, and others. Um, and what, therefore what goes with it is in going into these projects you really need to make sure you have a proper and deep understanding of your supplier base. Um, and it means understanding how they behave commercially, both as individuals and as a collective. It's also really important to be flexible. You know, the, the, the idea that embarking on a payment by results model that might be the first one that you could, would have used in a particular service area um, and, and get it right first time is, 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 is quite a big ask. So an approach where both the commercial model and the way you manage it provides for a degree of flexibility and ability to, to learn as you go and tailor the project on the fly, I think is vitally important. And, and therefore what goes with that is really focusing on the things that really, really matter when you want to deliver um, a result. 
and the tendency, I think, for anyone um, putting a, a service line out uh, to other organizations is to suddenly uh, begin to focus not on the outcomes alone, but to figure out, to introduce a whole range of constraints, which may individually seem to be important, but actually are not critical to the outcome, and they do actually materially and adversely affect the risk of delivery and the cost of the project. And this could be anything to do with particular ways of working or particular forms of data or presumptions about the mix of, um, uh, of IT versus people. If you want to focus on outcomes and pay on outcomes, giving the service providers the flexibility to figure out how to do it best is essential. And that does mean letting go in a way that the public sector is not always comfortable with. I think it's also important when you're embarking on these projects is knowing when to stop. Uh, you can't be dogmatic. Um, even though it's politically driven, if you look at an individual project and you're driven by a dogmatic view rather than a very practical view, the risk is you end up with an unworkable deal. And I think it's finally important to understand when you're trying to procure a service where you're having to make a market as opposed to just procure a re ready-made service uh, where it's already priced in a way uh, which is tied to outcomes. And if there's market making activity as well as service procurement, you need an additional set of skills. And therefore, I think the key message I'll, I'll put here is that the, the success or failure of a payment by results um, a project is, is likely to be found in those very, very early days of the project. Um, and, and what I mean here is you need to bring together commercial, financial, operational, and policy skills combined with a very, very good understanding of the market and really be very rigorous in thinking about the, uh, the commercial constructs the measures and all of the matters I've just listed before. Um, because it's, it's actually quite difficult to tailor some of these things on the fly when you're actually in the procurement process. Once the super tanker gets going, it's quite difficult to uh, get it to change course. And, and the projects I've seen where they get the thinking right and they get the right combination of skills right at the beginning typically lead to successful projects. Those where these are glossed over or there's, there's too much of a policy steer and not enough focus on practicalities really do struggle in their later stages. So I think with that, it's just final message, get the thinking done early, get it done right. Um, th these skills are not found in, in um, large numbers across government, so you'll need to seek out the people who have had these experiences and draw on them and draw them into your project and try to get the thinking done early on. Uh, in the ERG, the extent we to which we can help make connections or help in testing or thinking about the model, we're happy to do so. Um, so please approach us um, as, as you need. Thank you very much. Adrian, Mark. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mark Fisher. I'm Job Seekers Director at the DWP, which means I look after unemployment, although my mother in law says I'm responsible for the recession, which is um, there it is. I would say it's lovely to see all of you, but there's not actually the many I can actually see because of the, the way the room is quite dark. But I will spend a minute or two just whizzing through our experience of payment by results. Um, as Job Seekers Director, I'm responsible for the unemployment regime, which has two components. One is what we ask Job Centre Plus to do, primarily for the short term unemployed, and the second is what we ask private sector providers, voluntary sector providers to do, primarily for the long term unemployed. And the new government has um, spent quite a lot of time and energy completely rebuilding the unemployment regime to create a single programme of employment support, and that single programme is the work programme uh, for which I have been programme director. And um, that uh, single program um, is uh, hopefully simpler for claimants and better value for the taxpayer, primarily because it is based on payment by results. Um, this isn't the first time the DWP has um, done payment by results, but it's certainly the first time it's done it quite so sharply and with quite such a, in the way that the incentives work and everything. And certainly the first time we've given providers so much freedom to innovate, which is a, a key component of a successful payment by results system. Essentially, the, the work programme... Wait for these slides to just move on a bit. Sorry about this. Right, here we are. Yeah, the work program is, I'll just bring this up quickly. Yeah, the work program is essentially um, 
based on the simple premise of paying providers for getting people into work and for keeping them in work. I won't go into every detail of this slide. This is the way that the payment structures work. Essentially, for everybody, a work program provider gets into work, providing they keep them in work for longer than 26 weeks, they get a payment. They get a very small attachment fee for getting somebody on the program in the first place. And then uh, once they get them into work, after a period of uh, the job start, they actually um, will get what's called a job outcome payment. And that payment will chip in. Thank you. Aha, here we are. Thank you. That payment will chip in some 26 weeks or so after the person's got into work. And then if they keep them in work, they get sustainment payments, which uh, reflect the fact that the government wants people, to, keep, wants people to, to be kept in work as well as just simply getting into work. Now, those are payment by results. The difference between the previous programmes and this programme is the amount of money they get for simply, somebody going on a programme is tiny compared to what it was. Virtually all the money in the system, potentially hundreds of millions of pounds actually per year, goes to provide the payments for keeping people in work um, for up to 52 weeks. And what we've also done is arranged that they get differential payments depending on how difficult it is for somebody to get into work. For example, if they get somebody off, off incapacity benefit into work, they'll potentially get up to £10,000 or more for doing that. This slide simply shows the various differentials there are in that. What we've had to do, and this is absolutely key to all payment by result systems, is we've tried to be very careful about not paying for things that would have happened anyway. You know, we've had to adjust all these payments for this so-called dead weight, which is actually how much money, you know, what would have happened if providers had done nothing. And um, it's really important you get these calculations right. It's really important, building on what Adrian said, you're practical rather than dogmatic in doing this. We spent six months arguing with the Treasury about this um, before we agreed and settled a payment by results model that protected the taxpayer, that gave the right incentives to providers, and was really simple to operate. Uh, and hopefully that's what we've done. Um, I'll say one other thing about uh, incentives for performance, which is that, um, sorry, I'll say, before I go on to incentives for performance, I might say something about the way the money works. It's one of the key features of this scheme for the first time is we're paying for results, not just out of the department's Dell, but out of the benefit savings that arise from this scheme. And one of the key features of that is it means performance is uncapped. Essentially, there's nothing that stops providers getting people into work other than their success. You know, until we run out of JSA unemployed customers, they can carry on getting people into work, which is an important sort of feature of the whole scheme. I won't whisk through every word of this, but that slide is designed just to show how that works and how um, you can move people um, into work and get Amy as a result. The final thing to say really on the work program is one of the key other things we've done is provided incentives for performance for providers they have, to com they have to compete. We have two in each area. We have 18 parts of Great Britain work program areas. We have two providers in each, competing providers in each area. We will shift market share between them, between the um, worst and best performers, and we'll pay bonuses for the best performers if they exceed certain performance levels. So we're trying at all stages to sharpen up performance above and beyond what a simple payment by result system would have given you. Um, and finally, just before I finish, that's not the only payment by result system DWP is involved in. We're very keen to work with social partners, social investors on a whole range of social investment models. Uh, and whilst the work program is our sort of industrial multi-million pound, potentially multi-billion pound vehicle actually for, for payment by results, we also have a much smaller 10 million a year innovation fund, which is designed to essentially boost the social investment market by paying social investors by results starting first of all with people who are neat, young people not in education, employment or training. Can we find whizzy ways of identifying those at risk becoming, of becoming neat, uh, moving them back into education, moving them back into work? And we're gonna, we're, we've just launched the Innovation Fund and that is a way essentially of just trying to see if we can boost the social investment market. Uh, this slide explains how the fund will work. Primarily it is about um, can we find ways of paying for outcomes for neats keeping them, uh, returning them back into training or getting them um, off benefit. Um, that really is all I wanted to say. Um, clearly, you know, I think we're quite proud of what we've done both on the work programme and the innovation fund. If any of you have got any questions about our approach, then um, please do let me know, email me afterwards and I'll do my best to answer them. Will this all work? Well, for those of you who want to know the answer to that, I suggest you go downstairs to the Doctor Who 
uh, stand where you'll find some time travellers who'll be able to tell you what life will be like in two years' time where we'll know a bit more about when this is going to, be, when this is going to work. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. And I should just say that the slides will be available um, shortly from civilservicelivenetwork.com. So I know Mark and Rebecca are both rushing through their slides, and if you don't have a chance to note them all down, don't worry, you'll be able to see them later. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for having me. I'm uh, Rebecca Endeen. I'm the Director of Analytical Services in the MOJ. And you would uh, think, well, what's the Director of Analytical Services doing this for, and the answer is, is none of the other directors are available. Uh, but, the, but the real answer is actually that when we set up our uh, pilots in the MOJ, this was a very cross-professional uh, uh, ex experience, and we had to bring in commercial expertise, policy expertise, operational expertise and also analytical expertise, because if you're going to pay by success, the most important thing you really need to know is what you're going to measure, and um, does it work? So why are we interested in this? Well, a uh, coalition commitment uh, was that we would introduce a rehabilitation revolution. Uh, as you all know, money is very, very tight, uh, and the key principle here is that we would find some way of investing with independent providers to reduce reoffending. Uh, we would do it on a payment by results and we would use uh, the reductions, the savings we get from the reductions in reoffending to pay for the contracts. Um, this is completely new for us. We've never done anything like this in the past. So what our commitment is to do, we, we, uh, we've you know, had quite a lot of discussions in the department, but we're very clear that we really do need to pilot and prototype our approach to find out not only whether it works in terms of reducing reoffending, but also can we write the contracts, can we work out to measure it, can we find out all these things that could go wrong on a sort of prototype basis before we go national. And we've also been talking extensively with the DWP because they have had quite a longer history of doing it. I'm going to talk about the two pilots that we've set up so far, because uh, they're slightly different models, but they hopefully give you a bit of a flavour of how it works. So the first one here, let me just get it all up. The first one here is a pilot we've uh, introduced in Peterborough, uh, which is called the Peterborough Social Impact Bond. Uh, just very briefly, the way it works is that we've written a contract with uh, an organization called Social Finance. Uh, they are a not-for-profit organization who find investors, mainly charitable and benevolent investors from outside government. They are then commissioning third sector providers to deliver intensive uh, interventions to the group. The target group is the under 12 month uh, prisoners who are being released into the community um, from Peterborough. Uh, we, are, we don't pay uh, until we've been able to measure performance. Uh, if they manage to cut reoffending, uh, the frequency of reoffending in a target group by at least 10%, uh, we will pay them a uh, sum which covers the success, covers their costs, and provides a return. If they don't, we don't pay anything. Um, it's a proof of concept. Not only can we make this work, but it's also there's quite a lot of risk for them as well as for us. Uh, and we really want to test whether, whether this works, whether it will reduce reoffending, and whether it results in savings for us. Uh, the second model that we've got going at the moment is uh, basically uh, a model in Doncaster Prison. This is, this is a private prison, uh, and we recently recontracted, uh, recompeted the, the prison, and we reawarded it the, pris to the prison to the original provider. But instead of just paying for the, the running of the prison, we put an additional amount of the contract price at risk, uh, which essentially they will not uh, get unless they actually manage to reduce reoffending. So it's a similar sort of principle. Um, 10% uh, of the contract value is at risk. If they manage to reduce reoffending, they get to keep that money. Uh, if they don't, uh, they have to give it back to us. And then if they reduce reoffending by more than that amount, then they get basically a bonus payment on top. Um, this has just started. So a lot, as the same as with Mark, I mean, the policy problem is quite clear. Uh, I'll just talk about it quickly while I put these slides up. The policy problem is quite clear. Offenders who are released from uh, prison cause a lot, of, um, a lot of grief to the society as a whole. They're uh, frequent reoffenders. 
They have a lot of drugs problems, a lot of alcohol problems, a lot of accommodation problems, a lot of work problems. If we can manage to reduce reoffending for this group, we're likely to lead to a lot of benefits, not only for the criminal justice system, but for society as a whole. You know, on reasonable estimates, this makes a lot of sense, um, but we need to really work out whether we can work it, make it work out so far. So what are our key problems? Um, and why payment by results, as, as mentioned before, focus on outcomes rather than inputs on processes. We transfer risk to the private sector and the voluntary sector and innovation. In the contracts we've uh, set up so far, we've been very non-specific about what people need to do. Uh, we basically have uh, put some very sort of minimum ethical standards about uh, they're not allowed to bribe the re-offenders to not re-offend, they're not allowed to try and convert them religiously, but essentially, apart from that, they are allowed to find whatever methods that they want to do to actually reduce them. So we do not, we do not specify um, the processes and the everything, uh, and we just we just pay by outcomes, and we're just trying to encourage greater discretion and diverse delivery. But what are our problems? You know, what, why are we going slowly? Why are we thinking about it first? Uh, and the key challenge, really, it's never been done before in the justice sector. Um, what is the right outcome for, for providers? Uh, have we got the right measurements? Uh, are we absolutely sure that we're paying for success and not for events that would have happened anyway? Uh, do we care about perverse incentives in terms of creaming and parking? And if so, how do we want to structure the payment mechanism? And it's also, this is, a, this is an area where the private and voluntary sector providers uh, are, uh, the market is not incredibly mature and one of the challenges will be to grow the market and work out how the contracts work um, whilst, whilst, we, uh, whilst we pilot and roll out. And my last slide has, um, we, we've, got a, we've got, there's a lot of interest in what we're doing across government, but there's also some, uh, a lot of interest from America. We got lots of calls from the White House. Uh, they're going to announce their own similar payment by results by pilots on a very similar sort of principle. And it's an interesting idea that's just getting momentum, not here, but also abroad. And of course, in America, they're slightly different because they do have a lot of bigger charitable, benevolent uh, trusts who really do want to invest in this sort of program. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and move on. <laughs> Jeff. Uh, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Jeff Llewellyn from Wipro Technologies. Um, you'll have noted if you've read your program that this session this morning is brought to you by courtesy of Wipro Technologies. Uh, first thing to say is Whip Who, I guess, and that's an homage to uh, the events going on downstairs with the Doctor Who convention. So for those of you who are keen on uh, crosswords, this is where Wipro comes from. Um, but since 1945, Wipro has graduated to become uh, one of the biggest global ICT providers, um, providing consultancy, uh, outsourcing, and systems integration. And it's a pretty big company with 120,000 employees. Uh, today, and I will have to give a plug for um, stand number 54, where we have a number of things that I hope will be of interest to you. Uh, we're a tier one partner, that is a serious player with the major companies that you'll have heard of in the industry. Uh, we're also very interested in SMEs, and we have on our stand today a couple of interesting SMEs um, that uh, have got approaches to things like fraud um, uh, and development of software at radically cheaper prices than uh, can be done in conventional ways. For those of you who are interested in lean, which is a big topic, we have a lot to say on that. We've got a lot to say on green, We've got a lot to say on security and R&D, and then finally knowledge management. And I've had conversations, I think, with people in the last couple of days on all of those topics. Um, so we're now the biggest offshore supplier to uh, the utilities companies in the UK, and we are very active in retail, in um, utilities, and in finance. And we think at a very profound level, there are process analogies between what goes on in those industries and what currently goes on in the government and what could go on in the government where there are real learning opportunities. And I'll happily say more about that later. So uh, payment by results, 
Uh, it's not a new idea. It was something that the Romans used when they were in Britain. It was something that medieval kings used uh, to farm taxes. It was something that was used uh, very literally in the 1860s to talk about examination results. Uh, and in the 1900s, it was used to describe the initial thinking around how to manage productivity in, uh, in, in the manufacturing world. But it's still pretty challenging, despite the fact that it's been going on for a long time. So here we are in 2011, and I think many people would agree that this is a kind of a point of inflection. We've got a new government, we've got a new focus, uh, we've got a maturing ICT industry, and that's important because it takes two to tango. Um, we have, I believe, a productivity catch-up challenge for the public sector, and this is where some of the points I was making about retail and uh, banking come in, because if you consider the last 20 years in those two sectors, there's been a complete transformation of what goes on, and I would challenge people in the public sector to say that they have achieved the same transformation in customer focus in, in, the, pri in the public sector. And then uh, one of my hobby horses is that there's a need in the government to move from a Procrustes view of the way that civil servants work, which is kind of you fit in the framework or you don't work, to a Protean view, which is very flexible. And I can say much more about that as well. Um, but there are two, two key questions, I think, in terms of whether payment by results uh, is something that will really match the spirit of this radical change. Uh, one is whether the uh, industry is delivered, ready to deliver, uh, and bear in mind this is a, an industry that's delivering 16 billion pounds worth of services to the UK government every year. So is the, is the industry ready to deliver those new models of working? Uh, and secondly, um, is government ready to show the necessary commercial flexibility and uh, a greater appetite for risk? And risk has come out several times in what's been said so far. So just uh, some illustrations of where Wipro uh, is currently talking about payment by results um, opportunities. Um, obviously, I won't give the, the detail here because these are confidential, but uh, I hope I'll give you enough of a flavor. So here is one example where we are developing a solution for a government uh, client, and part of the payment that we get is contingent upon being able to sell that same solution to other clients in the same part of the, uh, the woods. Uh, and obviously, that means that we've got real skin in the game but also our client has real skin in the game because they will benefit if we manage to sell the solution that we think is replicable to other areas. Um, a, uh, what's called in the, in the trade a software, software as a service, SAAS, or a pay-as-you-go or a subscription model for the development of technical solutions to things like the work program that Mark was describing earlier on. Um, is a development that we've been working on for a number of uh, clients where, again, we're basically going to build the solution, offer it as a pay-as-you-go principle, and then if it works, we prosper. If it doesn't work, then we have a problem. And that's something where we have confidence in our own abilities to deliver a working solution um, and are taking that risk. Uh, and thirdly, thirdly um, we're looking in the academic sphere in, in universities, and this is where intellectual property and knowledge management come in, at a, uh, an innovative approach to developing a web marketing uh, solution for a university which has got some exceedingly interesting um, intellectual property which they want to take out on a global marketplace. Uh, we're helping them to develop a solution which will start as a subscription basis but then could become a joint venture. And of course, joint ventures are another aspect of the whole payment by results framework that we could perhaps discuss later. So the requirements as we see it for um, uh, making all of this a success are fresh thinking, above all. Uh, fresh thinking about the analytical model, that is the way you describe what's going on, what the key levers are that you're trying to pull in order to make the, uh, the system work so that both sides, the client side and the supplier side, are actually talking about the same basic model. 
there clearly has to be a very effective and agreed scorekeeping metric, and Adrian mentioned that in what he said initially, uh, so that both sides are confident that evaluations are fair and reasonable and that the goalposts don't move. That's obviously vital. Um, there's an issue around, quotes, excess profit, unquotes, where it's perfectly reasonable for government to wish to uh, see that profitability for services delivered to the public sector is, is defensible, is reasonable, but there has to be some sort of understood arrangement whereby if a company is doing extremely well at delivering the end result, the outcome, then there is at least a period during which uh, the benefit of that uh, greater efficiency can be reaped by the company that's taken the risk to do that. And that's a fine balance, and it's a fine balance that will only be struck through negotiation, I'm sure, but I know Adrian understands the, the, the principle of that kind of approach. There needs to be a changed mindset on the analysis, the management, and the tolerance of risk. And risk is one of the four-letter words that really is going around government a great deal at the moment uh, because it's absolutely critical to the way in which the culture needs to change, in our view. Um, uh, risk, because of the rather toxic media environment that affects everything that civil servants do, is something that I think uh, there is far too much concern about, and it's something which does militate against uh, effective cooperation to get better results for, for the public. And after all, at the end of the day, it is the public that matter here. Um, the, uh, the official journal of the European Union, which is the procurement process, which gives us all uh, sleepless nights, is something which needs to be adaptable to the circumstances of a commercial model which might actually evolve over a period of time. So I mentioned earlier on uh, a system that we were developing uh, for an academic uh, institution, and that's an organization that is a, a setup that might evolve from a fairly straightforward uh, pay-as-you-go towards a joint venture with bigger um, aspirations um, as time goes by, building upon the success. So there needs to be some way of understanding that those formal procurement rules are adapted to what is, after all, a joint enterprise. Uh, oh, and then don't forget mutuals. And uh, mutuals, of course, again, are a very uh, complex and potentially very exciting area that we all need to, uh, uh, to get our heads around. So uh, that's, a, that's a quick uh, uh, Cook's tour of... Um, of uh, our view in Wipro on the, uh, the situation. Um, listening to the earlier comments about the, um, the uncertainty about outcomes and the way in which uh, that uncertainty could be accommodated, I think it's always very useful to remember, I think it was Lord Leverhulme's comment that he knew that half of his advertising was wasted, he just didn't know which half was wasted. However, he went on advertising, and I do think that the same kind of principle needs to apply in the way that the government approaches the management of risk and the handling of commercial arrangements, given that it's embarked upon this road uh, towards a rather more um, uh, sophisticated approach. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, and don't forget stand number 54. Hey, thank you to all of you. I I do have a couple of questions, but I'm also conscious that we have overrun slightly, so I'm going to throw the questions right out to you guys and um, get as much discussion as possible in the time we've got. Does anyone have any burning questions for the presenters? Yep, there's a lady here at the front. I think we have a mic coming down. If you could just say who you are and where you're from, that would be great. Um, and I work for uh, the Treasury Solicitor as an employment lawyer. And I've just got a, a sort of observation, really, for the MOJ lady. I'm really sorry I'm hopeless of names. Um, but it's that um, I can see how payment by results can work if you're sort of producing boxes in a factory and you get 10p per box, and the more boxes you make, the more money you get. Because my interest is really in how all this is going to feed down into people's performance management. Um, but in, when it comes to rehabilitation of offenders, does, isn't it rather a blunt instrument? Because um, uh, these are very, very complicated issues, and the idea that you can kind of make things better by paying people more. I mean, there may be a, an element that impl the reason that things aren't working is that the staff actually doing this work 
um, are not sufficiently motivated and don't try hard enough. But there's also a whole raft of very, very complicated social issues behind all of this. Um, and it's just an observation about, about the whole idea of payment by results and whether or not um, it, it, it will work in every, in every environment. I mean, I know you said this is a brand new environment, we've never done it before, so in a way it's being piloted. But that, that's just my initial reaction. Okay, thank you. Becca? I mean, I, I think it's quite right that it, it won't necessarily work in every environment, and you need to think about quite clearly what your outcomes are. But the government's quite clear that its, a, its objective is to reduce reoffending, and if that's the case, then would you necessarily want to invest in anything which didn't actually do that? Um, I think there is a problem. There is the issue between the logic train about what the people on the front line do, and then how that feeds into the interactions with the offenders, and then how that might reduce their reoffending. Um, and there's an also an issue about if you're setting up these contracts with the private and voluntary sector, what should you do about your public sector performance uh, framework and what, to what extent should you get it uh, focused on outcomes. And, and I agree all these things are difficult and that is why, because it's a new area for us, we're looking at piloting and we're looking at seeing what works and seeing how we can involve public sector as well as uh, voluntary sector and private sector organisations in this sort of approach. I don't know whether Mark wants to add anything because he's been doing it for much longer. I suppose the only thing I would add is to, just to build on the point you made about how complex some of the circumstances in which individuals find themselves. You know, we have people out of work who are ex-offenders, we have people who are out of work who are ex-offenders with health problems, you know, the, we have people in very difficult family circumstances. You know, it is not simply the case that an employment intervention by itself would make a difference. Often it's a whole combination of different interventions. And I think one of the, one of the interesting things about the sort of black box approach we're using is it really does allow people to work in partnership. You know, if, if employment providers work in partnership with uh, the offender management people or pr prisons or the local health service, hopefully they will find ways of working together to achieve results that benefit the health system, um, Rebecca's interests and mine for getting people into work by working collaboratively sort of at ground level. Because I, I think you're absolutely right, you know, it's very difficult to put people into little boxes and then can construct performance regimes around them that meet all the needs. Yeah. This, a lot of this has got to be done creatively at the sort of at local level. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman just behind you there. Thank you. My name is Dave Atkinson from the UK Border Agency and I, um, my job is involving uh, with refugees. Um, and I just wonder if any of the panel just like to comment about um, the um, how to how we, how under this process under this system you avoid cherry picking, um, and um, if that's not clear, shall I just say what I mean by that? But you know, I'm, there's a concern that the most vulnerable will become more vulnerable because the organisations will choose those that they can get into work, or for example, or in whichever program it is. Yeah, well, um, inevitably the cherries will be picked and inevitably the organizations that are uh, in these contracts are going to make their easiest money from the cherries. That's absolutely true. Um, but it's also understood by any organization that's doing that that you've not only got the cherries but you've got the rotten pears to worry about as well. And that's where the negotiation um, around the nature of the contract and the incentives in the contracts comes in. And the fact is, you know, that the rising tide does lift all the boats, and some of those boats are going to be pretty holy, and some of them are going to be easy ones to float. Um, and I'm sorry, it does come back to my point about, you know, half of my advertising is wasted, but I don't know which half. Nobody is suggesting that you wouldn't do something which has got an element of inevitably hidden waste in it if the net effect is a major plus. I guess that you'd accept that from the MOJ and the DWP point of view. Yeah, Mark, I think I know you've looked yeah. at this particularly. I mean, I think I'm the, the question is a really, really important one. And um, I think the way we've tried to mitigate this is, A, with a payment structure, but I won't put back the slide. Basically, it gives differential rewards so that, you know, you just get more money for getting some of the hardest help mm. back into work than others. Um, we recognise, however, within each group, there's a risk that you 
cherry pick the most, the easiest of the hardest to help, if you sort of mean. Um, so we have to mitigate that, which is why we have a whole set of customer service standards in the contracts that basically say you've got to offer a service to everybody. Um, I mean, also relevant, I think it's highly relevant, is Jeff's point that actually the, the, the whole history of failure in attempts to segment customers by how they might get back into work, you know, the whole history of failure in sort of cherry picking customers, because simply it's very difficult to predict who will actually get back into work and who won't. And that actually helps because it means there's no real, there's not as strong an incentive as there might be to cherry pick. The incentive is to provide a service to everybody. But, you know, this is one of the areas where I think we're going to have to simply watch it very closely. I mean, I, I just add that, you know, this is clearly something that really concerns us. And the way we've done it in the Peterborough and the Doncaster pilot is we've said that we will pay you across the whole of the group. So, so the providers might choose to only work with half the group, the half of the group they, they perceive to be as easier. But in terms of what we're going to pay for, we pay for everybody. So they have to raise the offending rate across the whole cohort. They don't get to pick who they work with. And I think that's really important. Or they can decide to work more intensively with some people or not, but they take the risk that the people that they don't work with, uh, they clearly won't count. So I think that's quite important. There's different ways you can address this through the different payment mechanisms. But what you clearly can't do is allow an element of selection to go on. You can't allow the providers to select who they're going to work with because they will then pick the easiest people. Um, and you need to be able to take account of the fact that the ones that they don't pick, um, uh, you also need to reflect that in your payment mechanism as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other? I think there's two gentlemen just in that same row. I wonder if we could take the two questions together. Hi there. Um, Ed Price from DWP. Um, I think the savings um, paint by results uh, methodology is really clear where you've got a very defined target population that you need to work with, um, a very clear process you're taking them out of so that um, you can really quantify the savings. I was wondering the panel's view on whether they think we'll get to a point where we can use this for slightly woollier things. Uh, I used to work on ageing society and we looked at this in relation to falls prevention. So it stops someone from falling now they won't cost the NHS in the future, um, but actually quantifying that's really, really difficult. Um, and I wonder whether there might be a role for maybe when money's a l little less tight, um, some sort of innovation pool from Treasury where they have slightly lower sort of uh, demands on you to prove your case, and it allows us to experiment a bit more. Okay, if you could just pass to that. Thanks. Uh, Colin Goodwill, aid the pump for tra transport. The job seeker, seeker example seems to suggest that the payment's finished after 12 months. I was interested in how that was driven. Was it suppliers saying, we need to be paid back within that period? Or was it DWP saying, after 12 months, you know you've secured a long-term change in employment patterns and uh, that can give you a long-term benefit? Thank you. Uh, Mark, I guess your best place to answer that and then any other thoughts from the panel on uh, woolier groups potential yeah, for let that. Me, let me we'll deal with the JSA point and then turn to the sort of woolier, the woolier, the woolier groups, if I put it like that. Um, yeah, I mean the, the the payment duration point was a combination of both effects. One is, you know, there is a point when someone has got into work and been in there for a long time, the chances are they will stay in employment. So we've sort of calibrated it slightly for that. Um, and the other point was simply um, we've tried to make sure that for every one of our groups, whether it's ESA customers, job seekers or whatever, you know, there is a saving to the taxpayer in each group and we try to calibrate it that way as well. So it's a sort of mixture of both. On the innovation point, I, I do think, you know, both we and Ministry of Justice and others are sort of in the foothills of all of this still. I think one of the really interesting areas to explore will be how you can get this approach into, um, you know, other outcomes, how you can get this approach into multiple outcomes, you know, whereby you know, there's, there's a health outcome, there's an offender outcome, there's an employment outcome, there's a multiple outcomes. Now you can build models around that. And our innovation fund is an attempt to sort of dip the toe in the water of all that. You know, how can you, if you've got a social investor who's doing something you know um, can reward us, MOJ, other people, then how do you make a multiple system of rewards? It's fair to say it's quite difficult to do that. We've all got some work to do, I think, with the Treasury on the whole issue of social investment before there's a sort of a real enthusiasm for making it all work because you know public expenditure control 
does require some quite simple systems and uh, you know all these are inherently complicated systems so I think that tension is going to have, have to play out and I, I just hope by the time the next spending review comes along we've all garnered enough evidence to have a real go at putting these themes into the spending review because I think that's the only way that these things will really get life and breath other than as little experiments around the edges. I mean, I agree with Mark. We're, we're just on the start of a very big journey. There is the potential in a whole range of areas, uh, problem families, uh, you know, the NEAT group that Mark was talking about, social care, everything like that, to have longer term contracts with a range of different outcomes. Uh, I would just say that we just do need to remember about what our, what our responsibilities are in terms of protecting public money. So there's like three basic things we need to be able to do. One is we need to be able to measure success. We need to be able to write the contract and we need to be able to transfer some risk to, to the external provider. And if those three basic conditions aren't, aren't actually fulfilled, then we, we probably are in a little bit of trouble in terms of uh, managing public money. Um, but I, I would, having said that, I would say that I would never say never here. And, you know, I think a year or so ago, 18 months ago, someone had told me, Rebecca, you're going to go and do a social impact bond in Peterborough. I'd probably laugh them at my office. Um, but now, not that I have an office anymore, I'm in the upper plan. But now, I, I, we did manage to do it, and I, and I do think it's going to work. So I think we should definitely not rule out this innovative stuff, but there's a long way to go to actually work out exactly how this is going to work. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd just like to add one of the points, in my view, about the, uh, the innovation. And the first gentleman commented um, there about the way in which multiple problems uh, were associated with each other. And I think what is increasingly becoming clear now is that somebody who's disadvantaged at childhood is probably going to have worse health outcomes, worse, em worse employment outcomes, worse criminality outcomes, and all the rest of it. And to me, what that points out is um, something that really goes to the heart of the machinery of government, which still tends to see people as employment cases or justice cases or health cases. And I do think, and this goes back to my hobby horse about Procrustes and Proteus, I'm afraid, that there is a machinery of government issue here that needs to be addressed where, and it would be great if this were done in the, the, the next uh, CSR, where there really is an understanding of the holistic impact upon citizens of the things that are done by individual departments over their lifetime. And you, you might, if you take it an extreme view, you might say that that becomes very uh, corporatist because you then say, okay, so somebody is born and society as a whole has to make investments in them over the next 60 years to keep them on exactly the right track. And that gets very close to Big Brother. But I do think without getting into Big Brother territory, we can be much more joined up. Uh, that's an old piece of terminology. Uh, joined up about the way that individual departments deal with uh, the same people. Adrian, do you have anything you want to add on this? Uh, I, I think the, uh, just getting to the point of how you might stretch this um, and, and reiterating your point, in the end, any commercial um, arrangement, and this, this is what we're talking about, has to have clear measures. Um, it, it has to have... Um, um, parameters that both sides can work within. So I think it, if you are looking to, in terms of stretching this policy, there have to be certain truths that we adhere to if, this, if they are going to be manageable deals. So I'm all in favour of stretching into new policy areas, but ultimately it's got to be sort of a, uh, an understandable uh, and intelligible commercial structure for it to make any sense. Thank you. Uh, we had a question over here. Um, just it's this chap in there stripy shirt. Thanks. Um, Chris Thaid, um, Department for International Development. Um, one of the things that surprised me slightly about the um, MOJ presentation was the idea that you've transferred risk. I can see that you share some financial risk, but in the end, if it all goes wrong, you're going to have to deliver all the services. So it doesn't seem to me that you've really genuinely transferred risk. So a follow-up question is, is um, whether you, how you manage the risk if your, some of your suppliers um, uh, go bust because you're hoping to create a market and you're faced with the consequences of, of coping with that. And the second question is in the long term, if it's all successful and you don't want to pay for what the normal, what would have happened anyway, how do you continue to evolve your metrics so that you... Um, 
push for greater levels of ambition rather than saying, well, we got 10% improvement and now we'll continue to pay for 10% improvement forever? Both very good questions. I mean, I mean, on the risk front, if it doesn't work, we're not going to pay any money. I mean, you know, and it is pilots. Um, but there is what you're, what you're getting to, which is the, can you really transfer the political risk of failure? So the point is, is if our providers go bust or it doesn't work, we've put such political capital into this, into this idea, won't we surely bail them? And all I can say to you is the Secretary of State stood up uh, in front of all the providers and made it absolutely clear that we're not going to do that because unless you make it clear that you're not going to bail people when they fail, then the whole thing will not work. You have to be absolutely clear that you know if it's a failure, you're going to have to be able to let it fail. That's that's quite tricky for politicians, but I mean our politicians, my Secretary of State, very clearly understands that problem. He's very clearly against. Uh, it's really clearly up for it. The second issue is that as you move from a pilot issue to actually doing this on a national basis, how do you keep on ramping up performance? And I think actually if you look at some of the ways the DWP have done it on a national, uh, on a national basis, it's quite interesting, which they have a baseline performance and they get providers to compete against each other for further improvements going forward. And I think that's a quite interesting model that where you, you might do it. And I think there's various models you might look at, but, but the one where you have the providers competing against each other for ever continuing improvements and getting being paid as a result is, is a good one. And we might want to talk about it a bit. Yeah, just to say one thing I didn't make entirely clear, but um, although to begin with providers are paid a little attachment fee, after the midpoint of the contract the system is entirely payment by results based and that the amount of money they get for standstill performance goes down but is then topped up by um, a performance bonus system that basically gives them more money for exceeding performance. So there's a, a ratchet throughout the system for increasing performance and they compete against each other. So, you know, we've tried to do what we can to make sure there's a sort of an incentive to increase performance. We've had to judge it quite carefully because as Adrian has said, and he's absolutely right, whatever else we do, we have to have commercially valid, viable propositions. So we've, judged, we've had to judge what the market will bear. We think we've sort of tried to push that as hard as we can. We'll see how it goes. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, we've got two in the centre here. Um, we take those together as well because we're getting to the end of our session. They're just on either side of the aisle. If you could put your hands up again, that would be great. How do you stop your suppliers acting as a cartel and forcing changes to the business model? Oh, sorry, I'm John Blythe from Job Centre Plus. I do know that under FND there was some people pushing for that sort of thing. And uh, it could happen again. How do you stop it? I think then, everybody. Katie Owen from the Treasury. Um, it's been highlighted as a risk, um, but I was just wondering how you're going to ensure and enable um, small charities to be included as service providers who clearly don't have the funding to be able to follow this kind of model. Um, I've heard of um, potential... Um, Think of whether a number of companies will go in together. How do we ensure that um, larger organisations who have the power and the finances don't take advantage of small charities and then, and then charities end up not making, you know, not, not getting the good out of this? Thank you. Anyone like to go first on? Sorry. I feel those maybe both, certainly the, the one about FN Flexible New Deal cartels. I mean, we were quite clear what we wanted to avoid was the same old providers simply moving into a new world, and we have. There, is a, there are now more providers in the market. We had actually very healthy competition in each contract area for new providers, and there are some quite new international providers in the business. But we were very clear in the way we configured the competition. We did not want you know, particular providers with very, very large shares of the market. So you know, we've done our best to mitigate that effect. Again, we'll see how it goes. On the voluntary community sector, that is a really important point. You know, um, actually, one of the things our ministers were very, very concerned about was how this would be how this whole system would affect the voluntary community sector, because actually it's the voluntary community sector who have most of the expertise about how to get particularly the hardest help into work. So one of the benefits of the prime contractor model we've used is that it's the prime contractors who hold the risk. They hold the risk of the payment by results, and it's up to them how much of that they pass on to their subcontractors. And there are, the numbers do shimmy about a bit, but there are probably 500 or so voluntary community sector bodies in the work program supply chain somewhere and uh, you know and we'll have to see how that goes but it is in the commercial interests of the prime providers to use the voluntary community sector because that's where um, 
you know, that's where the, uh, the, a lot of the expertise lies. Having said all that, you know, the work programme is not a simply designed to be a subsidy to the voluntary community sector. The work programmes are getting people into work. There are voluntary community sector bodies who are fantastic at getting people into work. The voluntary community sector bodies who are less good at getting people into work. And we have to be quite hard-nosed about that in terms of how we configure results. You know, this is not designed simply to protect a particular sector of the business. No, and Jeff, if you want to come in on that small organisations, because it could equally apply to SMEs doing something innovative with... I ICT, as you've um, mentioned. Yes, absolutely, it could. And I think um, uh, you know, different organisations have different degrees of um, regard for the benefits that small organisations can bring. Uh, I think that um, uh, we in Wipro certainly take the view that we don't have all the bright ideas and therefore the SMEs can add a lot to us. And in the kind of social enterprise arena, um, where we get into that through our attempts to work with the DWP, we understand that it's always very good to tap into and um, work with the people who've got that engagement and that understanding of what's going on on the ground. So, I mean, basically our doors are open for business and um, uh, the way in which we would integrate them into, their, into our supply chain, as, as Mark has said, you know, depends on particular circumstances of what they can offer. But we're certainly open to do that. I think we've got about two minutes. Does anyone have a very quick question at all? No? Oh, oh there was someone. Sorry, I can't see very well. If someone at the back. Oh, gosh, if you can run quickly up there. <laughs> I'll say my closing remarks as we run. I just think it's quite interesting. It's been brought up a couple of times that the uh, potential of focusing on outcomes and payment by results to break down the kind of silo thinking and to... You've talked about sharing solutions across different things. You've talked about working with NEETS, which presumably impacts a lot on DFE. So I think that's a very exciting potential of payment by results. And last question. Okay, sorry, but I realised this would resonate so much. Maybe I would have sat near the front. Uh, my name is Ken McLaughlin from the Rural Payments Agency. Um, all the panellists today are all, you know, putting their example in their models with um, 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 private um, um, sort of uh, providers. Um, was there any scope to bring in uh, any government agency which was looking to actually adopt the principles that we've tried that and didn't, weren't particularly successful, <coughs> but ultimately on something that's civil service live in respect of civil service jobs, it might have been recent to see some department talking about how they were looking to move to a process to adopt that? Okay. Uh, Jeff, I think you wanted to... Um, well, yes. I, my last bullet point was uh, mutuals, um, and Adrian will perhaps have something more to say on this from the policy perspective. But we're certainly very interested in the idea of mutuals because uh, the opportunity to bring into um, an enterprise people who've got the kind of detailed understanding that existing civil servants have of the problems, the challenges and all the rest of it is great. And so again, we're, we're very open to that kind of uh, possibility. Uh, if that was the thrust of your question, uh, are we up for mutuals? The answer is yes. We'd like to understand a bit more about how exactly they would work, but um, in principle, it sounds a good idea. Uh, yes, yeah, so part of my team is, is looking at the scope for setting or, or working with civil servants who deliver service uh, services, in my particular case, across central government, and looking for the, the scope for um, uh, reconstituting those um, uh, those services under mutual or mutual joint venture structures. In that world where that can be made to work, you can absolutely bring together that mutual mutual JV structure with a service contract with the host department, which is um, uh, based on outcomes. And, and certainly that's an area where we're, we're looking very actively at the moment and we see real scope for that. Any other thoughts from Mark or Rebecca? Okay, well, thank you to the whole panel for coming and sharing your expertise. Thank you for you guys for your questions and your time, and I hope you